Hello, everyone. My name is Travis Cummings. I am an anchor and reporter for Today in St. Louis at KSDK, and I am absolutely thrilled because today I am joined by some of the greatest luminaries in the St. Louis area. Today we are here at Drip Community Coffee House on Potomac in the Tower Grove South community. And might I mention, it is black owned, it is woman owned, and it's also queer owned by the wonderful Latasha Baker. And so when you walk inside the doors here at Drip Coffee, you will see that it says, welcome home. And so to you all, I say, welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. Today we're having a conversation, a really candid conversation about what it means to be black, what it means to be a part of the LGBTQ plus community here in the city of St. Louis, because as we know, they all intersect, right? And so we're going to really have a, a deep, meaningful conversation. And I ask that you all, you know, pour your hearts out onto this table as we have this conversation today and really talked about your lived experiences. And so I like to say welcome to Randy Rafter. Uh, the, the executive director and CEO of Black Pride St. Louis. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Jordan Braxton. Hello, Black Pride St. Louis board VP. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for asking me. Ohan Ashe, hello. How are you? Community activist, uh, the founder of For the Culture SCL. We see your name in lights all the time. Good to see you. I'd like to say hello to Marilyn Bell, the founder of the Popular Institute of Film here in the city of St. Louis. Thank you so much for How having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Ebony Brabham, a veteran and counselor here in the city of St. Louis, also a part of Black Pride yes. St. Louis. So thank you so much for being here with us. And so we're going to dive right in because I really just want to know, as we turn into 2024, how does it feel to be a Black being, an African American, and a queer person in the city of St. Louis? Well, I'll start off by saying it's... Um, W.B. Du Bois talks about it a lot and within the souls of black folks about the double consciousness of being both, um, I say black and being queer. Um, it's an inner turmoil that we have to go through because I, we almost never get a break. Um, I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of my culture. I'm proud of my heritage. I'm proud of who I love and who I cherish. Um, but at the same time, there's some different challenges that we see on a regular basis uh, from my blackness and my queerness at all at the same time. So it can be a challenge um, here today, but we've come so far, but yet we still have a far way to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Merlin, you're someone who documents this. I lived yes. experiences. Yes. Black queer people in St. Louis. Absolutely. How are you feeling right now in this climate? Wow. 2024 is uh, quite a time to be alive. Um, even with so much going on, we still have so much to do. And kind of what Randy was saying, uh, we've made some amazing strives uh, here in this community, um, the culture of this community, it has become a little bit more progressive than it was yesterday, but we still have to look at some of the disparities. Uh, some of that is violence and crime against uh, trans women and men, uh, also our younger LGBTQ plus uh, individuals. We're still experiencing uh, disparity, disparities with health um, and, the imbalance between the black LGBTQ plus as well as versus the white LGBTQ plus community and the haves and the half nots, you know, back in high school, you know, a dear friend of mine got kicked out of his house for being um, in the queer community. And so these things at that time put a lot of fear in me into staying, you know, kind of hidden, staying in the closet, um, not trying to make waves. But fast forward to 2020 and to now, it was like, I, I, I wanna take control of my narrative and I want others in the community to be able to take control of their narrative, to be able to be black, queer, proud, um, because the more of us that come out and unite, the better it will be for the rest of us and the future generations to come. And Ebony, I want to come to you on that note, because as problems arise, as questions, as concerns from our LGBTQ plus community arise, we look for outlets, being a social worker, a counselor. And so, you know, this is something that you experience individually, but this is also something that you help our community with. Um, honestly, you brought up fear, and it's a very scary time um, from my perspective because I'm seeing our youth 
who may not be out, who may be questioning, um, they might just be feminine presenting or masculine presenting and it's going against what the society wants them to do. And then their mental health is totally ruined because they are feeling like, I can't make it in this world. I am not accepted at school. I'm not accepted in my home. I'm definitely not accepted at church. Um, I'm not accepted anywhere. And so a lot of times they're going to the extreme of, I don't want to be in this world anymore. So suicide rates try to start to go up depending on what our um, possible president that might be in the office. They might mm -hmm. make some changes that are going to be even more scary. I saw a lot of people in the trans community when they saw our changes in the um, medical coverage change. I, I it, it, it broke my heart to have one person who was living the life as fully as they could live it. And they decided to kind of transition back as much as they could because they did not want their children to possibly be taken from them. So for me, it's scary because I see mental health problems rise to the utmost. And I think big, I, and my heart is big. I, I care about pretty much everybody. Um, so it hurts my heart when I see these type of things happening. So right now, 2024, um, personally, of course, I'm, I'm making it because I've lived a lot of lives. And it um, depends, depends on the day. One day I might have an experience with someone at a store and that makes me feel some kind of way. I might have experience at work, maybe feel some kind of way. But other days I'm fine. Um, but then of course, when I work with my, my clients, they're telling me their stories and work with my, my, I have two sons who are teenagers and I talk to all, a lot of their, their friends and um, I'm seeing what they're going through and I'm like trying to help as much as I can. So, and we don't have enough people to understand them. We don't have enough people that want to understand them. Mm -hmm. They want them just to change and, and fix themselves because they think that being I mean, homosexual in any way is, um, I don't know if you know, but a lot of times people think it's a mental health problem. At one point, it was in the DSM as a mental health problem. Luckily, it's not in there, not listed that way, but um, I, I'm, always, I'm always trying to proclaim to people, this is not a mental health problem. Um, it's, that's something totally different. This is something that's a part of who they are. So um, I like to make my, my, I like to raise my voice to help people know just love people, you know, just love them. No matter if they're something that you don't feel like you could agree with, get to know them as an individual first before you decide to hate them. So wow. I'm not sure if I'm, I can go on for days. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and when you talk about school, work, these are all spaces that the queer community has to exist in, right? That the black community has to exist in to make sure that we have a fruitful community, a fruitful society. And so um, when you are fearful of going into those places, that can be difficult. I wanna come over to Ohan Ashe because you have committed your life and your work to creating spaces for black people, queer led yourself and making sure that people have a realm that they can exist in truly. And so talk a little bit about that work. Yeah, so when you ask the first question of like, what does it feel like to be Black and queer in 2024? For me, it is empowering because I know what my ancestors and elders have done before me. I know the work and the foundation and I can see the progress. But I also feel a little concerned because in the spaces that I create, I want to make sure that LGBTQ people, trans people feel safe, seen and visible. And in those spaces, I understand that our own community still is not very accepting. And as an activist and coming from activist work, I constantly say we will not be free until trans black women are free. And it is very hard to get our community to understand that when we oppress each other, we are only helping to further oppression. So creating those spaces and and allowing LGBTQ people to just feel visible and seen and accepted and, and heard and understood is so important to me because I know what it's like to not have a lot of space. Yeah. Jordan, you have existed in St. Louis for a long time. Since it was time. founded. Yes. <laughs> Since St. Louis was founded. And so there are layers to your story. There are layers to your experiences here as a Black queer person in St. Louis. So, where are you now? Okay, so I always start with, I recognize my privilege. Sometimes my experiences are not what other people's experiences are. 
And I have to recognize that because I am always reminded that I have passing privilege. And I'm, okay, I'm like, I use my privilege to make sure that, other, that I bring other people along. So when we talk about mental illness, 1973 is when the medical journal took being homosexual as a mental illness out of the medical illness. Mm -hmm. However, trans people wasn't until 2017. Because what happens now, everybody thinks, oh, we have marriage equality. We good, we good. Mm. But no, trans people don't have equality. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting for our jobs. We're still fighting for homes. We're still fighting for food. We're still fighting for medical attention. We can't go to a medical provider without having to explain ourselves. So those things are things that we need to work on before we can even say trans people are getting <clears throat> are equal. And as an activist and as a person that works um, to write some of the things, some of those, because we have seven, we have 21 anti-LGBTQ laws in our house and Senate right in Missouri. Last week, I went and spoke against seven of those, seven. And most of those, one of those was defining what sex is between a man and a woman. And you're like, no, sex is on a is on a spectrum mm -hmm. and they don't understand that so when you have your people making laws to understand the difference between sex and gender how do you think a community knows when they think oh we're all equal but we're not what is it like for you in st louis right now what's your experience <laughs> uh my experience has been uh bittersweet i love st louis it's a beautiful city. It has so much potential. Um, yet, at the same time, there's so many challenges that we face on a regular basis. Um, Jordan brought up on the unhoused community. Well, statistics show that 40% of the unhoused community identifies being part of the LGBT community. Most of them happen to be people of color. And we understand that because it goes back to the stigma that falls within our community and our culture. So when, uh, when we're fighting to make sure that someone has a roof over their head, so they have a place to sleep, so they have food to eat, it becomes a challenge, especially when you, when you sit in certain, sp certain spaces. Uh, I literally, literally just this morning was trying to help someone find a place that they can sleep um, because it's raining and cold outside. Imagine something like that being a, a challenge that you can't and that you're having because you don't have the proper resources that are available. It's hard for you to get a job because of who you are. If you go to a place in the company and with Missouri being this at will state uh, uh, that we can let you go for any particular reason. Luckily, in the city of St. Louis, it's more of a safe haven because we have laws that are protecting individuals from such. But that's not always the case in all of our areas and all of our circumstances. So. I see the challenges within our community and then it's what I always push forward to because I always tell myself I needed to be what my 14 year old self that was out at 14 needed to be. I needed to be there for those things for that next generation and for my, my siblings here in our community as a whole. I'm just going to say this. I think sometimes that our cisgender gay men forget that it was trans people that helped them get where they are today. We were there for the AIDS epidemic. We were there for Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We were there for marriage equality. Do you know how many benefits I did to raise money so you they can get off the bus to go to Washington to get married or to just to go and march for equality? Now that I need you, where are you? Where, where are my um, gay male siblings, white ones? That can, the black ones too, let me not leave those out, child, because they're not there either. You know, where are y'all to help us when we need y'all? Because we're getting murdered, we're getting brutalized, we're, we're getting married, we're getting, not married, Lord, we're getting murdered by people who say they love us, but then they don't, there's no, there's no, they don't, they're never about to trial. They're still out there because especially black trans women are second class citizens. Now, if you ever go to Jefferson City and listen to the people who introduced the bills, you see exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's because when people who propose these bills, they have no clue of what it's like to be trans. They just think we're some kind of demonic monsters that rose up and all of a sudden trans people have been around. We've been around since the beginning of time yep. and we're not going anywhere. And when you listen to people running for office who say they want to eradicate transgenderism, that means you want to get rid of a whole culture of people. How are you going to get rid of trans people? At one point, I cannot detransition. I've gone past the point of no return. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? You know, intersex people, 
intersex people, you can't say that sex is as men and women when you have intersex people who are biologically both male and female. You can't write them out of, no legislation you can write can write them out of existence. So how do you, just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We need our black people, our trans people in the House and Senate in Missouri. So when people say, you know what, I'm gonna pass this anti-trans law. That person can say, no you don't because you don't understand. And that's why we need to disseminate this information into our rural communities, into our metropolitan communities that know what they're saying is not true. It's not just something you wake up to, but they just think it's something that we wake up because that's what they've been taught. And we, the more trans people we have out there, the more black people out there telling us stories, the more they will see their misinformation. Representation matters. Representation matters, yeah. yes. Yeah. And that's interesting, Jordan, because you grew up in a time where you didn't have the influence of television, on that scale, social media on that Child, scale. We had four stations when I grew so, up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so people weren't talking about this constantly. Um, and that some may argue, well, I'm seeing this, so this is why I'm deciding to be trans. Uh, but and it's, so, it's not, you don't decide to be trans. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I think that, but a lot of people argue that, oh, because my because my child is seeing this on television, my child is seeing this on Facebook, oh, that's why they're deciding to transition. So it's interesting to hear you say, no, like <laughs> I woke up and I, you know, once I, I realized who I was, this is the journey that I took. Yes, it, it, took, it took me a lot longer than most of them. But I remember telling my family, I'm a girl. And they went, no, you're not. Yes, I am. You know, I remember one time my cousin, she saw me do something and she said, you know, I promised your mother on her deathbed if you turned out to be queer, I would tie you to a tree and beat the queer out of you. And those kind of things you don't tell an eight, nine, 10 year old. That stayed in my mind for a long time. Yeah. But you know, now I'm 63 years old and I give zeros about what people think. I walk in spaces where people don't go, like a lot of trans people say, why do you go to Ballpark Village? Why do you go to the blues game? Because I can. What's stopping me from going? I wish someone would say something to me. <laughs> Because I'd be like, I'm, okay, you, that's your problem, not mine. So Ebony, before the break, we were talking about coming out and I had asked a question about, has our experiences changed? Um, what hasn't changed is what we're experiencing after we come out, right? Um, still being shunned from our families, still being shunned, shunned in our workplaces, in our houses of worship. <laughs> Uh, so you were you were going to talk a little bit about processing that. I was just processing. Um, I know I remember Jordan saying how um, you came out and just you, you said you felt like you changed, you transitioned later in life or like a little later than people think that we should do something like that. But it, you got to recognize that if you don't feel safe in your own community, mm -hmm. you don't feel safe in your mm -hmm. own home, um, you're afraid of losing what you think you have, which might be um, your family, um, which is all you know most of the time or your whether it's church family, your biological family. Um, and I definitely can relate to that because I definitely came out a lot later. Well, I guess I came out to everybody else, but I sure it was, I, I definitely was doing my own thing, still mm -hmm. dating and everything. But it just takes a while to get used to that. Because so even as a late starter coming into the community, it can be hard because you're not used to being so free. You're not used to being so non-fearful. Hearing you, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I had had that freedom to fight for my voice to be heard or fight for other people. But um, I think that's one reason why what you do is so important. Is people are seeing um, the narrative and they're becoming more free. Um, people are seeing what you're doing. Um, myself, I come more free every day. I can't say I can ever get to the point where I feel totally free mm -hmm. until everyone's free, mm -hmm. um, especially hearing the stories of um, people getting killed and. And, and, and that takes me back to, you know, we were talking about this um, in between break. So what's changed for me now is that I feel so much freer now. I know that outside of my regular family, I have more family. Um, being a part of Black Pride has been wonderful um, because I feel like, wow, I have people that can understand me. Now, we might not talk every day, but <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where I feel like, okay, if my parents decide to disown me again, um, if my sister decided not to talk to me ever again, um, I still can make it. 
And I'm, off, I'm hoping that we all can continue to be that voice for people so that they know that you can make that choice early or even if you do it late, we'll still support you. But um, I thought that was my change is I'm a lot more free now. And I um, recognize that it's not just what I've been presented with in this world. There's a lot more to see and a lot more to um, experience. Yeah. Yes. So there lies the question, when I don't have that support in my own home, who can I run to? And so I want to kind of talk a little bit about support, both professionally and personally. Do you feel that in St. Louis? Do you have that support? And Ohan, you know, you have started a movement uh, to sort of create that element um, in the lives of Black people, in the lives of, of queer folk here in St. Louis. Do you feel supported in your mission? I definitely think that support, I mean, being in the LGBTQ community is creating community for ourselves. That is our story from our history, from our birth. So when we just talk about support existing, it exists because we had to create spaces for it too. Mm -hmm. Now, could it exist more on more mainstream levels, on political levels? Absolutely. We've talked about the dangerous legislation that's going on. We talk about how people have to hide in their jobs, in their families. So can we all be better at being supporters? Do we all need more support? Absolutely. But I think when we talk about like what community does and what it can build and what it can bring, we see all different types of people sitting right here, creating different spaces and different avenues where we can show up and exist. So support is out there. Now, our mission for more and more support is going to exist for a long time. But I think we can be happy that we do have people that care so much to create spaces for us. The stigma is real. Stigma is our biggest challenge that we're going to be fighting against. And so it's important for us to make sure that our voices are heard, um, but also to support one another, to make those different uh, opportunities. I salute you for all the things that you've done to make sure that we, we have that support system to support each other because our culture is important, our heritage is there. And so it's important for us to make sure that we come together and break those, break the stigma around it and develop new ways and new ideologies to show that we are who we are and we exist and we love and support each other. So yeah, definitely, because once we do that, we're gonna, it's gonna start amplifying to the world. What are some of the things that St. Louisans can be better at in this support? First off, conversation, mm. like this. Having these conversations with individuals who might not even could think like you or have different ideologies that, than you. So you can have that opportunity to discuss it because you can see those things differently, but then you can come to a common ground and see, well, I'm just like you. I'm going through these same experiences that you may be going through. My experiences may be a little different than what you're going through. So I can give, I can have that conversation and give you that dialogue because it's going to help to expand those communities and expand our horizons in that, in that thought process. So conversation, that's key. Any other ways that we can be better supported? Take yeah. action. Absolutely. Yeah. Take action. Because we were talking about doing the break. So I was talking about the HIV epidemic because that's what I do in my field. I work in HIV prevention. And back when the epidemic first started, no one was talking about HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. So we had to act up. I was part of act up. I threw water balloons on politicians. I changed myself to the to um, city hall. I was out there m marching and tearing stuff up. But <laughs> you're like, no one was listening. Yeah. And now you're in city hall. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so now I'm in city. But you know, we, it took those things to make people listen. And I think we're at a point now where we're gonna have to act up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. to break the law, but just to get people's attention. What do we need to do? And I always say, again, we need black people, we need trans people in our House and Senate here in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Being transgender is beautiful. I have, I have gender euphoria. Mm -hmm. I love being trans because that's, I've waited all my life to say that. Mm -hmm. And, but if every time I turn around and I hear you're nothing but a piece of poo poo, then I'm going to start believing that because that's what people say to me. But if I say, no, I'm not, and I'm not afraid of you, I'm not going anywhere. I don't care how many laws you write, how many presidents you elect, 
I'm not going anywhere. So you're going to have to get used to it. We used to say, we're queer, we're here. Yeah. I'm trans and I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And in our black community, we have to stop being so um, apathetic mm -hmm. and saying, well, that don't bother me. I don't care who's president. I'm still going to get my girls. No, if you don't care who's president, then pretty soon you won't be able to go do the things you do because right. there's laws that says you can't. And your local officials as well. So it's important yes. for us to make sure we talk about voting education and voting rights and getting out to vote. Those are going to be some key things and some key areas that we need to look at from the president all the way down to your local alderman to, uh, and, and local politicians, your local state reps, your local state senators. It's important. Your alderman. It's important for us to have those conversations with them so they know what's going on and what's happening and making sure that our voices are heard and our voices stand because we're electing these individuals in there. And if you don't like what they're doing, run for office. I'm going to support you. I'm going to love on you. I'm going to give you what you need to make sure that you're going to be supported. Now, obviously, we all have friends in other cities and we've all even lived in other cities. Um, what are some of the conversations popping up when we talk about experiences in those different places? And is that something that we can borrow from those areas? You know, um, are they able to go into spaces and feel free, you know, to speak out loud and, and act out loud. I think for me, um, part of my journey has been stepping out of St. Louis. Um, in the beginning, it was more running away from the city. Um, it threw throughout my twenties and all that stuff. But then I realized it, you know, an epiphany happened to me, uh, around 2021 to where I was like, I, I have to stop running. You know, um, part of the thing that I didn't uh, like somewhat about St. Louis is that crap in the bucket mentality. Uh, it's like, oh, I have to be the first. I have to be a pi pioneer. I have to be the trailblazer. I, I, I have to be number one at this. And it's like, why are we competing? What are we competing about? You can't compete with something that you're not. Yes. You know, you can't compete. You can't uh, be the next Apple or be the next Microsoft. There's, there's not going to be another one of those. Right. So what can you do that is authentically you based on your experiences? And that's what I bring through Poplar. And that's what's so unique about us. And, you know, being able to share that platform with other organizations that are like-minded and stuff brings, uh, builds bigger community and invites more of an audience in. And that's what I had to kind of learn over the past few years is, you know, enough of all that running or enough of all that, you know, the, the grass is greener on the other side because I can make the grass green here. I just have to put in the work and put in the effort. And there is a bit of sacrifice and compromising, but it creates a more fruitful environment for everybody, a more inclusive environment for everybody. So that way we're not losing folks but we're, we're, we're actually gaining people. So people ask me all the time that they other season, why do you, why as a black trans woman with all the work that you do stay in St. Louis? I say, I'm a lifelong Missourian. I was born and raised in Kansas City, went to college in Springfield and live and work here in St. Louis. I love Missouri. I love St. Louis. We have so much to offer here. The other cities don't that we sometimes get in our own way. And you know, so I'm here to fight because I love Missouri. I don't like her much right now you know? <laughs> because of the legislation out there. But if we keep on our mayors in our major cities to keep moving forward and passing laws and writing executive orders that protect our LGBTQI community, Kansas City, for instance, is just is a sanctuary city. Why can't St. Louis be a sanctuary city? Um, we, um, as being part of the mayor's um, LGBT advisory board, we presented her with some findings last year. So here's our report. So going forward, what can we do to take some of those findings that we find and actually implement them? Mm -hmm. Because I'm the chairperson of that, com of that committee, and I want that committee to be functional, not just a resume holder. Mm -hmm. Because I think as an advisory board, we should be able to move move the things forward maybe not pressure yeah we have pressure i'll use that word pressure to, to do more things yeah. to make st louis a more inclusive not only for just trans people but more inclusive for our whole entire community yeah. because we have a strong lgbtqa community here in st louis 
it's fractured and it's tribal. We got every space is over here, every space is over here. So we've got to come together. We need what we don't have right now. We don't have a common fight. We had the AIDS epidemic, everybody came together. Yes. We had marriage equality, everybody came together. But right now we have trans liberation. So Jordan, we were talking about experiences outside of St. Louis mm -hmm. and this idea that people run from St. Louis and not fulfill their purposes here in their hometowns mm -hmm. or if even if you're a transplant mm -hmm. and you want to serve a purpose here and you were saying how you know we can do that work right here at home mm -hmm. because but in order to do that work we need to come together and collaborate I think that's one of the things that we miss here in St. Louis is that yes. we just collaborate yeah. with each other right. we're so busy trying to use like being the first this or the biggest this or I did this or how about we did this? Mm, right? We yes. come together and there's organizations and sponsorship that you can get from, from corporations that say, okay, let's say that Black Pride and the Culture Festival will get together and you work and you get those sponsorships and you make that festival bigger and grand and you take it to that next level. If four or five organizations come together and work, we can get those words out and we can start making change. Yes. And I think that's what we just need here in St. Louis. We need more collaboration than plural style being so competitive. competitive, yes. Yeah. Competitive. And it shouldn't be, oh, I support you or I support you yeah. behind closed doors. Right. And then, you know, in public, it's like, I don't even know who you all are. Yeah, and so it, it has to be, uh, you know, practice what you preach, um, giving people their flowers, because I know you were talking about Jordan on the memorial quit, uh, quote, uh, excuse me, but giving people their flowers while they're still here. Yes. I see too often that, you know, you have these massive funerals uh, here in St. Louis and people are crying and all that stuff. And, that uh, you know, I, I hear that. But the thing is, what did you do while they were here? And if we can practice more about being there for each other, collaborating with each other, meaningful collaboration, not, you know, clench fist um, behind closed doors, but all of that stuff this community will be even stronger. We will have an abundance of resources because the more that we all partner and collaborate, that's more funding. You know, being number one or being the only one, that doesn't secure a lot of funding. That secures part of the funding over a bigger sea, ocean of funding opportunities. So that's why collaboration is beneficial <laughs> and people are, you know, mindsets just need to change. And also educated about, you know, business, not-for-profits, the power of just being together as a authentic community um, and not just saying, oh, I'm, I'm here for so-and-so or I'm here for this, you know, it, because all, all that individualism is, it, it has what has held us back as a city, as a region. Um, and, it, you know, with 2024, my hope, uh, not just for Poplar, but for as a bigger community is we can be able to come together, especially with everything that's going on politically, with everything that's going on laws, with everything that's going on with our young people, you know, they need to see that we are united because if we're not united, they sure ain't going to be united, you know, so. And it's also up to the media to start highlighting our stories too. Yes. Because sometimes if it's not newsworthy or you don't think black or trans people will sell a story, y'all have to stop thinking about that. I'm not picking on y'all, but I'm just saying <laughs> that sometimes we get left out because you might want to come cover our story, but then somebody got shot on the west side. Then all of a sudden we're left hanging because there's a more sensational story to tell. Did we see a lot of news media at Black Pride? Mm -hmm. No. If we saw them at um, other festivals, because <laughs> I know because I do PR for one of those festivals. Child, for the sip my water on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're you're right though because that's what was so frustrating to me uh, over the summer is we're talking about the young people on Washington Avenue, the shooting that happened, and yes, that that needed to be on the news, but you can't say one minute oh, well, our youth is out of control. They're, they don't have any spaces or places to go. And yet there's plenty of spaces and plenty of things to celebrate and pl plenty of things to talk about. We don't need to create more new initiatives and constantly thinning out the resources. We need to focus 
on like uh, everyone has said the resources that are already present and uh empowering them and amplifying them more so that way people know that they have safe spaces or just places to go to year round because you know black pride STL. that's that's how i found you all because i was scrolling through uh, uh instagram because i saw that and i was like okay i want to be you know a part of this movement uh and so it's just there's so much good that's actually in the city there's hundreds of things that are happening in the city it's just because there's one or two bad things that's what ends up soaking the oxygen out of the room yes. mm -hmm. and it's like how can we have a balance because obviously you know the media will continue to be sensational but how can we balance that out with something that is working yeah yeah well it seems like we all have some priorities <laughs> that we will leave this room with um, some action steps that we need to take some conversations that we need to have and not eliminating our history in that context because that's going to be so important as we pour into our communities coming ahead of us and so i just want to say thank you to all of the luminaries here in this room i feel honored to be here and leading this discussion thank you for your work that you do every day and Thank you for your fight. Thank you for your fight. And I think, cause this is a, a constant battle. Um, and I think that the people watching at home will see this and hopefully you all will be inspired by this as we celebrate another Black History Month, but a conversation that doesn't exist just within February. <laughs> uh, you know, because again, this is, these are experiences that we're living out every day as we go to work, as we go to school, um, as we, you know, celebrate on the weekends and, and party with our friends. And so um, I really appreciate you all being here. Jordan, Ohan, Merlin, Ebony, Randy, thank you so much. Thank you for telling these stories through different lenses and, and, and not forgetting about St. Louis. So we appreciate you having us. Thank and you. A part of your story and your time. And thank you all so much for watching. We appreciate it.